Uh, we've had trouble with recordings, and I apologize for that. I will. Uh, hopefully this time it will go okay. Um, we'll pick up where we went off last time, and we will um, um, talk about a couple more things um, to sort of finish up forms. Um, the two things, two new things that we need to talk about are radio buttons and um, HTML5 form controls, which are a whole thing, whole topic unto themselves. And then we'll start tables. So let's look at this. A couple things I want to review. We'll look first of all at the search one. That was the very first form we covered. And I want to look specifically at one thing because I realize that it's it's a little hard uh, and some, some students I know had some issues with this. Every every semester some a couple students have an issue with the one particular part of the form. So that's why I'm going to go over this example again. This is a form that does a Google search. So we type in HTML and it does a search on HTML, just as we'd want it to do. If we look at the HTML code for this, we'll notice a couple critical things about this. And that is the attributes on the form tag. You need two attributes on the form tag. You're always going to have these with server-side scripting. There are defaults for these. So I guess strictly speaking, that's not true. There are cases when you can use a default. But for the most part, you're going to have these two um, attributes on the form tag. The first one is the method, which is either get or post. Remember, get sends it on the query string, post sends it a different way, a way that's hidden. For example, if you're going to send a password um, from an HTML form to a server-side script to be processed, you wouldn't want the password to appear as part of the URL. You wouldn't want it to be on the query string. So therefore, you wouldn't use get if you were like logging on to a system, all right? Because with that, the password would be on the URL, and anyone could see it, all right? So that's one reason why you wouldn't use get. It really is. It really depends on what the server side is expecting, all right? My suggestion is. Um, and in this, this particular assignment, your homework assignment, I think you can use get or post and it will work. All right. The only difference being is that get allows you to see the, the data on the URL. So that can be useful if, if you're debugging. Like if you're not getting the results that you want, you might look at the URL to see what you're actually sending to the server. So get means send it on the, uh, as part of the URL as part of the query string. So for this class, that's what we're going to use. Post. That's a topic for another day. But the other part that's important is action. And action is the name of the script that you're sending your data to. Remember, a script, a server-side script, is a program that runs on a web server that takes your data and does with, with something with it and creates an HTML page custom for you. All right, so in this case, it does a search, and it returns a search that matches exactly what you've typed in. Well, you have to tell, the form has to know where it's, where, what script is going to be processing the data on the form. So therefore, you need the action. All right, and in this case, the action is the Google search page, and that's the URL for it, http colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. Now this is like uh, links in, the, in that because this isn't something that you've written, you need the HTTP in front of it. So you couldn't just say www.google.com. You have to say HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. 
and it has to be correct, and it has to match it exactly, of course. Now, for your assignment, I've given you the script that you need to call. It's something like HTTP colon slash slash CISS web dot CCC dot edu slash something 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 something. I don't remember the rest of it. But you have to have that exactly. Think of this as the address that you're sending this envelope to. All right? That's the name of the script that's going to process this data. So you have to have that included on your form for your phone to work. If you leave this out, your page will simply reload. It will simply call the page, pass the data back to your original form, and the page will reload. Let me show you what I mean. If I eliminate the action, if I don't have an action, and I go and do a search, if I type in something and click the search button, it calls itself back, and it gives it the data. So if you ever see something like that, where it simply reloads the form, it got rid of what was in the form, and it shows it up on the query string, uh, string, that means that, hey, you forgot to put the URL in the action. Sometimes you want it to call itself. There, there's ways that you can do that in server-side scripting, but not in the examples that we're going over in class. And the, uh, not, not in the example, in this example that we went over with the Google search, nor in the example for your homework assignment. You're going to you need to have that action in. All right, so that was the one thing I wanted to review today. Second thing I wanted to review today was with this one. And this one, we deliberately don't have an action for it because we don't have a server-side script to process this. This is just to demonstrate the, the processing of form. So I think I put in a dummy action just to show you that there needs to be an action, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah, I have action equals process.php. Well, there is no process.php, and therefore it's not going to do anything. Let's review a couple things about this. We introduced an additional set of tags, the field set, along with the legend. That allows us to sort of divide the form into sections. All right? That is useful both in the sense that it makes it look better and look more organized, and that's also useful for accessibility issues, to divide the form into different sections. The legend is what appears here. We added a whole bunch of different tags associated with this. We still have our form tag. Think of that as being the envelope of all the stuff that we're sending to the server. The action being the sort of the address that we're mailing that envelope to. The script on the, the, those, the web server script that's going to be processing this data. And then finally, we have a list of different form controls. We have a text box like we had before. Another text box. We have a label, and the label is used for accessibility. We link using the ID. Remember, the name has to be what the server expects, and the ID is used for the label, to match the label, the text of the label, with the form control. So that people that are using a screen reader know that this text box belongs with this label. It's the ID that links them together. We have a drop-down, which consists of a select tag, with a name and an ID, and then a variety of option tags, which defines the, the list of options. Why do you use a drop-down instead of a text box? Well, uh, a, a, a drop-down limits the selections. So instead of being able to type anything in, you can only choose from a list of predefined options. And that's very useful for a lot of different things. 
those of you that may, may have had a database course or will be taking a database course, uh, a lot of times web pages are connected to databases, which means that the database is expecting the data in a certain format. Your web form has to supply it in that format. So in this case, the example that we gave, we said the state, the database, the pretend database that we're using here, is expecting a two-character code. So therefore, that's what the value of the option represents. The value of the option represents what is going to be sent to the server. The stuff between the start and end option tag is what the, what the user is going to see. All right? It's what the user is going to see. Because again, you know, with states, all right, maybe people know the state codes. Maybe people don't. But a lot of times with codes, maybe you have part numbers or product numbers or course ID numbers or something like that. Those aren't always things that people easily remember. But maybe a more descriptive words, people will remember and will understand that, you know, a 16 gigabyte USB drive. You might not know the part number for it, but you'll recognize the word, the description, 16 megabyte USB drive or something like that. 16 megabyte? What am I in? Like, I meant gigabyte. I say, am I living in, like, what would that be? Uh, 2001 or something? I don't know. Uh, at any rate, what's between the start and end option tag is what the people are going to is what's going to be meaningful to the users. The value is what the server-side script needs. We looked at the checkboxes also. The checkboxes are, remember, checkboxes are for choices or options that are not uh, mutually exclusive. So, for example, in this case, we have things that you're interested in. Networking web development, mobile development software. You could be interested in any mix of these. One but not the other, or all of them, or none of them, I guess, or whatever, all right? So they work independently. They're not linked together. You can tell their checkboxes typically because they are shown, they're being displayed as squares. All right. When we see radio buttons in a minute, they're going to be displayed as circles. Finally, we have a text area, which is for uh, free-form comments, where you can have multiple lines of, of data. So uh, input type equals text. A text box is a single line of data. A text area is multiple data. Last but not least, we have a submit button that sends everything to the server to be processed. The last thing that we're going to review is how I've made the form look the way that I have. Remember, I'm not going over every single thing that we ever talked about with CSS. Because anything that we talked about CSS that we used anywhere else, we can use here as well. All right? So it's not like I have to go in and, and say, well, you can set the background color of a field set, or you can set the size of a text box, or you can set the size of a legend, or whatever. If you can do it in CSS, you can do it to these tags as well. All right? Um, but what I did is I put every form field in a li tag as part of an unordered list, the text for the, for the form tag, uh, or for the uh, form control, I have in a label, and then I have the form control. I then, through styling, made it look nice and neat by getting rid of the bullet points, putting some space between the items, giving the label a constant length, or width rather, and aligning it to the right, that way, all the labels line up here, and the input controls are right next to them. But I can do anything else I want to do style-wise to this. I made here. I made the text area bigger. I did the vertical align of that, which didn't work. 
Um, so we'll get rid of it. And so on. That would be a fun little thing. Figure out how you could vertical align that uh, label to make it display on top. I have a feeling I just made a dumb mistake and I don't feel like looking at it right now. All right. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to do radio buttons. And then we're going to get on to the um, HTML5 form controls. Radio buttons work like this, and the, this is probably the most confusing for most students control. I'm going to create a brand new form with just a radio button on it, and then we'll incorporate that into, into this bigger form. But I want to start out by putting the radio button on a form by itself before I start putting in the label and all those things. So I'm going to create a radio button. And I'm going to write a real limited Google search. I'm going to write a Google search that only allows you to search for one of three things. All right. HTML, JavaScript, or CSS. All right, pretty boring, all right? Okay. So, first button I'm going to have, I'm going to put a radio button, and radio buttons are input with the type equals radio. Name equals Q. Where did I get the name Q? Well, that's what I know that the search term has to be called in the Google search script. So I know, to, you know, I had a text box called Q. I'm going to have a radio button called Q now. This is an interesting thing. I can, I can actually write a search that uses a radio button to input the data instead of a text box, as long as I give the name that Google's expecting. And that name, of course, is Q. Now, the ID for each radio button has to be different. HTML. And the value is going to be what the script is going to see, HTML. So let's talk about these three things. Input type equals radio says that we have a radio button. The name is Q. The name for all my radio buttons that belong together have to be the same. That's what makes them work like radio buttons. So if my three choices to search with are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, they still all have to have the name of Q. In this case, Q. All right. They all have the same name. They all are going to have different IDs. How do I know that? Well, every tag on my page that has an ID, the ID has to be unique. So I can never have two things on the page with the same ID. That's just a rule. So these tags are no different than any other tag. So I can't have two things on the same page with the same ID. Lastly, the value of the radio button is going to be what is sent to the server. So if the first radio button is selected, it's going to do a search for HTML. If the second radio button is selected, it's going to do a search for CSS. If the third radio button is selected, it's going to do a search for JavaScript. Now, if I go and, and, and save this, 
and I look at it, I have these three buttons with no idea what they mean. So I'm going to have, I'm going to, have to have labels for these, right? So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to say, Label 4, QHTML, search for HTML. Label for QCSS, search for JavaScript. I'm sorry, search for CSS. QCSS, search for CSS. Finally, QJavaScript. Search for JavaScript. All right. So each of them has a label. And remember, like any of these, the label uses the ID to link up with the form control that it belongs with. Each of them has to have the same name. That's what makes them act as a radio button. Each of them has to have their own ID because no matter what, IDs have to be unique. And then finally, each of them are going to have their own value. And their value is what gets sent to the server if it's the one that's selected. So now if I look at this, Search for HTML, search for CSS, search for JavaScript. All right? Now, there's a couple things that we can do. But if you notice, one thing that you, you notice right off the bat is it's not always obvious what label goes with what button now for someone that can see. Right? Because it's kind of hard to tell this. Is that... Sir, is that after search for CSS or is it before search for JavaScript? Well, it belongs with CSS, but I might want to make that more visually obvious. So I could do that a couple different ways. I could put them in their own line, or I could put space between them, or anything that I would want to do. Um, so maybe I put them in their own li tag. Or maybe I put a style that says Inline block, margin, right, 25 pixels. And now if I view this, it's a little more obvious that this button belongs with CSS and not with JavaScript. Now let's see how this works. If I pick the first one, if I pick one of the other ones, notice that whatever I have selected gets unselected. I can only have one of them selected, and that's the radio button part of it. Remember, a radio button is similar to the typical use of a drop-down in that you have options that are mutually exclusive. 
So you can't pick more than one. You can only pick one or the other. Now if I go and do the search, it goes and it sends on the query string whatever the value was, in this case HTML. If I pick JavaScript, it'll do a search like that. Now, what happens if you call these by a different name? Let's say I make a typo and I call that QQ. If I were to do that, then it would no longer work as a radio button. So if I pick that and pick that, it left that one checked. And check that. These two work as radio buttons, but this one doesn't. What happened if you search? What happened for what? What happened if you search? What do you? Uh, I was going to say, what do you think is going to happen? But that was that, that would sound like sarcastic, <laughs> wouldn't it? You, you missed you missed the, the fun bit at the beginning of class. I started off in a bad mood, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, at any rate. What do you think would happen? I ask inquisitively. Would it search for both? No. It's not going to search for both. It's going to search for the thing that has the name of Q. It's going to send Q and QQ to the web server, but then the web server is written in mind to look for Q, so it's going to ignore that extra Q. So if I have both of these picked, Exactly. If I just picked the CSS one, nothing would happen. All right. So if you notice, I went a little quick on this, but notice it did send QQ up there as well. But the Google script has no idea what QQ is, and therefore it just ignores it. Now, you're never going to have just one radio button in a set. So if I have a yes or no question, I'm not going to have a radio button that says check this for yes and uncheck it for no. Why do I say that? Because if I click on it, I can never click it off, click off of it. All right? So, you know... If I were to have let me get rid of this for just a second. If I were to have a single radio button, if I click on it, there's nothing to click off to make it get unchecked. So you're never going to have a single radio button by itself. You can have a single check mark by itself, uh, a check box rather, by itself, uh, because again, those represent sort of independent options. A lot of forms have the option on the very bottom, do you want to join our mailing list, for example? Do you agree with the terms and conditions? And you check it, or whatever. All right? A check box, you can check on and you can check off. A radio button, you can check on it, but unless there's something else to click on, you can never check off of it. So if I wanted a text box, to, or I'm sorry, a radio button to have a yes or no, I'd have two radio buttons. A radio button for yes and a radio button for no. And then I, would, I could toggle between those two choices. All right, let's try to build this within the other form. Um... I think in this example we said we were going to have level of schooling. So I'm going to put that here. And there's a bunch of ways we could do this. I'm going to do it like this.
one for a high school student. I'm going to put one for a high school grad. Again, remember the name's going to be the same. The ID has to be different. And the value has to be different. I'm assuming that that's what the server wants. High school. HSG for high school grad, HSS for high school student. And CS for a college student. And if we look at this now, Of schooling, high school student, grad, college student, and these work as a unit because they all have the same name. All right. They, the, everything I talked about in this section would work in HTML uh, 4. So there's nothing like newfangled about this. This will work on everyone's browser. So you go to the oldest computer that you know of with the oldest version of the browser and everything that I, uh, unless it's like in the Smithsonian or something, all right, every uh, web browser, you know, beyond a certain point would understand this form. So these are the basic HTML4 and previous form tags, all right. Okay. Now, we talked about HTML5, and HTML5 is the newest version of, of HTML. And we've also stated that um, um, not all browsers support HTML5, all right, which is a little bit uh, of a problem, all right. But more and more browsers are supporting HTML5. So what do you do? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first I want to show you what some of the HTML5 form tags are. For the most part, HTML5 form tags are different versions of text boxes. They've made text boxes for specific purposes. In HTML4, there was one kind of text box, a text box, all right? Which means that you put any kind of single line of text in a text box. So you put a person's phone number in a text box. You put an email address in a text box. You put a uh, date in a text box. You put a number in a text box. You put letters in a text box. You can put anything in a text box, and any single line of text is put in a text box because there's only one kind of text box. In HTML5, they've expanded it to make like different variations of the text boxes that handle certain kind of data and do a better job at handling it. So instead of one all-purpose text box, there's now some text boxes that do specific things. All right? And this is a big help. All right? We haven't talked about validation yet. In HTML 4 and previous, there was no validation of forms. In other words, there was nothing we could do to make sure that the user made a choice. All right? Um, we could default something, like with a radio button, we could say that it was checked, or with a checkbox, we could say it was checked, or with a option on a dropdown, we could say it was selected. But we couldn't guarantee that they made a particular choice, or that they put something in a text box, or put something, or made a selection uh, from a dropdown, or whatever. That's where it's one of the purposes for JavaScript. So in HTML4, when people wrote forms, they would write JavaScript to make sure that people entered in the form properly. So that if you tried to enter this form and you didn't put in a person's name, it would tell you, hey, you forgot to put the name on, in there, and you'd, you'd know to go back in. And you could write validation for all the different fields for it. Some of the HTML5 controls, however, do that stuff by, them, by itself. 
which is really a nice thing, right? Really a nice, nice feature, all right? When it works, all right? So what we're going to describe is we're going to describe how the HTML5 tags work and what happens if you have a browser that doesn't support those HTML5 tags? All right. What I'm going to do is go to our friend, W3Schools. <coughs> and I'm also going to pull up Can I Use. Remember, Can I Use is a website where I can look for certain HTML5 features and it will tell me if I can use them or not in browsers. So under input there's a color input type and we'll see this. Or you can allow the user to pick a color. That doesn't work in Internet Explorer. That does work in Edge, Firefox, Chrome, does not work in Safari, does not work in iOS Safari, Opera Mini, but it does work on Chrome for Android and so on. So remember, you do have this as your friend of the different um, input types. So I'm going to go and go to w3schools.com and look for HTML5. HTML5 tutorial. HTML5 new elements. input types. Um, here we've already talked about these, the text box. The one thing we didn't talk about is a password. With a password, it's like a text box except what you type in doesn't show. So you simply say type equals password. There's a reset button that allows you to clear out a form. I would suggest you don't use the reset button because usually people click on it accidentally and it doesn't do any good. All right, here is the HTML5 types. And the first one of these is color. So I can click this. And it, the HTML5 color looks like this. Instead of type equals text box, it'll say type equals color. And you can pick the color that you want. Simply by clicking on it, you get whatever your operating system's color picker is. So you can pick, okay, that's the green or red. Let's say I, I want green instead. I click OK. It changes my selection to green. If I click Submit, it tells me that's the hex code for that. Something like this could be useful if you were uh, allowing people to choose the, their own color scheme. All right? You might ask them, what do you want your, what color do you want your text to be? All right, or something like that. You could give them a color picker to pick that. Because your average person doesn't necessarily know <coughs> HTML codes off the top of their head, or hex codes off the top of their head. But you could have them, well, pick that. Whoops. I clicked the wrong thing. Click that and say, oh, I think I like this kind of blue. Okay. And then they, they have it. And that's the color blue they get. Now, let's see how this looks in Internet Explorer. And this is actually a very clever feature of the way browsers work. Is this Internet Explorer or Edge? I think this is IE. Yeah, you're in um, Internet Explorer. Notice how this works. In Internet Explorer, it doesn't understand that color tag. 
But all isn't lost. Because anything that the browser doesn't understand as far as input tags, it reverts to a plain old text box. All right? So, you can type in the color that you want, if you happen to know the hex code. Maybe you could put a note on the page saying, if you're running Internet Explorer, here are some hex codes that you could use. All right? And if you click that, it'll work. Now, the only difference is, is in, on the browsers where this input works, you automatically know for sure that you're getting a color out of that control. Here, you'd have to put some JavaScript validation in to make sure that the, that, that the person entered in a valid code. So, it's a great thing that these HTML5 controls eliminate the need for some JavaScript validation. The unfortunate truth, though, is, is because not everyone uses a browser that supports the HTML5 controls, you're still going to have to do some redundant JavaScript validation for those people that don't use them until we can safely say that all the browsers, that, that, that the browsers that people use um, support HTML5. So that's one of the things. There's a color picker. There is also a date picker. All right. What do I mean by date picker? Well, I can only type in a valid date. Let's say I try to type in the 13th month. Ooh, it changed it to 12 and it gave me a little electric shock. It didn't really give me an electric shock. That I, I was a joke. All right, that would be kind of mean, but it would get people's attention. You got to admit that. So I can only type in a valid date. So I can't type in something nonsensical. So I can't type in the 45th of December. It changed it to the 4th. I can't type in the 30. I tried to type in the 33rd and it changed it to the 31st. And then I can type in a year. So the control itself keeps me from entering in a bogus date. We also have this little thing that allows you to go up or down a month, day, or year. And we have this guy that gives you a calendar that you can pick. All right, what day did I want? I wanted... Uh, January 1st of 2019. So I could pick it from the calendar that way. And it guarantees that the date that you enter in is valid. You don't get that with a plain text box, right? This text box, if it were a date, I can type in a date in here. But I could also type in a ridiculous value for a date. And there's no way of it knowing that that's supposed to be a date. So I'd have to have JavaScript to do it, to, to make the validation. Now, again, this is great if the browser supports the date control. If it doesn't, like our friend IE here, then <coughs> I'm left back with a text box. So I could type in any old garbage and it sends it to the server. All right? So the bottom line with this is before HTML5, you had to write JavaScript code to validate your forms. The HTML5 controls get rid of the need to do some of that validation. Some, not all. However, because I can't guarantee or you can't guarantee that the person using this is going to have a browser that supports these HTML5 controls, you still have to write JavaScript validation even if you use the HTML5 controls. Now that's not a reason not to use those controls, right? Use them and you'll give a better experience for your users whose browsers do support those controls. Just remember that you have to build in that redundant control for people who have the older browsers and you'd have to write some JavaScript. Let's, the rest of them is it's a common theme. 
So we had we had the date, we had the color picker, we have a date time. So I can put in uh, a date like the the class lab today starts for it's the seventeenth, right? Twenty eighteen at noon. So I can put a date and time in there. An email. I can't just type in any nonsense because I get a neat little error message. And I didn't have, to, didn't have to write any code. I just say input type equals email. Just like I didn't point it out, but on the other ones it had input type equals date, input type equals date time, and so on. So there's these different types that work. All right? So that's pretty cool. Month. You can just have someone enter a month. A number. If you know that it is a number, and you know that the quantity has to be between 1 and 5, you can put in a number between 1 and 5. And I can't put then 44 in, because it will give me an error. I can use these to go up or down, but it will stop at 5 going up, and it will stop at 1 going down. I can also say something is required. I can give a range. How good do you think this class was? Horrible? Excellent. You can slide that slider along there and pick it. So the bottom line is these HTML5 controls give you a better experience for your user for entering data in. You do have to remember that not all browsers support them, so until you can pretty much be sure that all browsers support them, you are going to still need to repeat JavaScript for that. All right. So we've wrapped up forms. Next time we'll start with tables. I'm going to go make sure the lab is unlocked. I'm going to then come back, grab the files here, and then...